Hello, this is Free Thoughts Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Russian of East Tennessee. I am Imam Haq Abdel Fattah. And I'm Jonas Holdeman. We want you to know that if you don't believe in God, you are not alone. Right here in East Tennessee, you can find free-thinking atheists and agnostics. This is a show for them and for people committed to a life rooted in science and free of supernatural beliefs. Today's show topic is Leaving Islam. Today, I will be interviewing my co-host, and we will be taking calls. But first, we want to tell you a little about our sponsors. The Atheist Society of Knoxville frequently has a fun meet up at a bar or eatery. Tonight's meetup is at Barley's in the Old City, starting at 5.30. Look for the silver jack uh, uh, jacketed copy of the God Delusion standing upright on the table. And as Matt Delonte at Atheist Experience say, everyone is welcome to our happy hours for food, drink, and conversation. But if you plan to preach, proselytize, uh, provoke, or punch, please don't. The Rationalists of East Tennessee have several regular monthly meetings. The first and third Sunday mornings in the month are usually lectures with lively roundtable discussions. Second Sunday, we hold a uh, book club discussion. And the fourth Sunday, there's usually a get-together we call a reflections meeting that features a potluck lunch in someone's home. Visit our websites for additional details, including times and locations. In the news. We have been watching for some weeks now the activities from Saudi Arabia. On October 26, 2013, for the third time, women in Saudi Arabia have organized a day of driving automobiles in defiance and of challenge to the male-dominant uh, patri patriarchal culture. Driving while female is not permitted, it's not prohibited by Saudi law, but uh, because of religious edicts from the clergy there, driver's licenses are not issued to women. Even women who have international driver's licenses are not allowed to drive. Well, last week we reported how the website had been hacked and vandalized. It uh, looked like this. Uh, the defacing on the October 26 driving.com website mentions a three-letter KSA, which probably means Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. But now it is back to its appearance prior to the hack. So uh, if you look at the top here, it says, um, uh, which means that woman driving is a choice, not obligation. <clears throat> Women have shared their photos and written notes about their defiance of the oppression. CNN reports that, unfortunately, some women appear to be targeted for harassment as they are reporting they were followed by cars filled with men since Saturday, October 26, and some report that vehicles have been parked outside their houses. The New York Times reports on a man jailed for expression of sympathy with the women. Uh, Tariq al-Mubarak, they report in part that he published a commentary on women's rights, and he has been detained by the authorities as they cracked down on a campaign by the kingdom's women this month to defy a ban on driving. Now let's hear some of what he wrote. Tens of thousands of female students are learning what independence means due to several years they spent studying in the West. Young people, both men and women, have become responsible for building their personalities and giving a special meaning to their lives. This new self-regard is crucial to forming their hopes for the future, and it cannot be ignored simply because it is a cultural trait, especially in an open world such as ours today. We will keep watching this. News out of Washington State. An article on the uh, website examiner.com begins with the headline, Christian homeschoolers receive maximum jail time for death of child. Larry and Carrie Williams were found guilty of causing the death of their adopted daughter, Hannah, by using biblical-based parenting techniques found in the controversial child rearing book to train up a child by Michael and Debbie Perrell. Uh, Superior Court Judge Susan Cook 
uh, sentenced uh, Carrie Williams to 37 years in prison. Her husband Larry was sentenced to just under 28 years. Uh, the examiner further reports to train up a child advocates using a plumbing tool to beat children uh, with starting at age one. The book also advocates giving children cold water baths, putting children outside in cold weather, and forcing them to miss meals, as well as beating them, all of which exemplifies the abuse investigators said Hannah endured. The book is also linked to deaths of at least two other children, four-year-old Sean Paddock of North Carolina and seven-year-old Lydia Schatz of California. In each case, punishment techniques advocated by the controversial Christian parenting manual were used. While I do not believe in the supernatural, if there were a loving God, I would ask that she write in her book next to my name that I condemn these people and the book they follow. Okay, now to our uh, program, Leaving Islam. And uh, we have a uh, uh, exp expert in that sitting beside me. Uh, viewers, uh, this is a call-in show today, and, uh, and you'll find the uh, number uh, posted on our uh, video here. And uh, today I have with me Imam El-Haq. Uh, thank you for hosting with me. Um, I have wanted to share my experience with everyone. Uh, uh, how about uh, if you help me and the viewers with pronunciation of your name, and perhaps we can uh, become somewhat more worldly? <laughs> sure it is. Uh, Imam al-Haq Abdul Fattah. Okay. Uh, so, Imam, uh, can you introduce yourself and your background? Uh, sure. As I said, my name is uh, Imam al-Haq Abdul Fattah. Um, I was born and raised in Egypt. Uh, I was born uh, and raised 26 years as a Muslim um, in a, a moderate, uh, a very open-minded Islamic uh, family. Uh, my dad's background was, uh, he was a Sufi Muslim, uh, which uh, Sufism is a sect of Islam that adopted uh, more philosophical views and uh, they tried to stay away from literal um, uh, explanation of the Quran and the Word of God. Um, actually, a lot of their uh, beliefs um, are adopted from the Greek uh, uh, philosophers. Um, they are very similar to the Gnostics uh, back in the days in, uh, with Christianity. Uh, I moved here to the States eight years ago um, to pursue my PhD in biomedical engineering. Um, and this is what I'm doing right now. I'm a professor in biomedical engineering. So, and I'm here to share my experience with everyone. <laughs> oh, but before you uh, went into uh, biomedical engineering, uh, you also uh, did some studies in anthropology. I did, actually, it's, it's a big part of my research right now. It's, um, um, and one of my passions is uh, looking at different morphological variation uh, in humans <clears throat> between different gender and races. And this is actually what started uh, made me start thinking about evolution and was actually one of the first triggers that made me rethink my entire uh, faith when I got closer to uh, the scientific method and uh, learning about the evolutionary process. Uh, so this was one of the big triggers for me uh, to think about and evaluate everything. Uh, uh, just to, to get off text here just a little bit, uh, I, I was doing some reading on Wikipedia and um, uh, Wikipedia states that uh, uh, one of the first persons recognized to uh, speak about the scientific method, to adopt the scientific method and uh, measurement and so on was uh, uh, Islamic uh, and um, so we, uh, we we can thank the uh, uh, that that culture for uh, introduction to uh, some of these methods. Yes, it's actually it's true. Actually, it's one of the uh, one of the points that I'm, I was going to talk about today. Uh, but uh, yes, the Islamic in early uh, Abbasi era, uh, the open-minded uh, Khalifas, which were the rulers of the Islamic. Uh, uh, land, uh, they really um, 
uh, encouraged everyone uh, to start uh, translating some of the Greek literature and some of the uh, scientific knowledge that's already there. And he um, encouraged uh, philosophy and uh, free thinking. So this was the period where everything nourished. And this was the period where the main uh, scientific contribution or scientists that be, uh, uh, they were related to Islam uh, came uh, from. But just as a correction, Yes, he was labeled as a Muslim, but he wasn't a truly Muslim because most of these people, they were actually, some of them were agnostic and some of them just, just couldn't say that they don't believe literally in Islam. Well, we uh, could bring that to, to modern times. Uh, <laughs> if, if you look among Nobel laureates, uh, there are not many uh, Muslims uh, with awards in physical sciences, and one of them, I, I think, I get uh, this is why I. I. Rabi uh, was um, uh, was was did receive the award, yeah. and uh, when he went back to his uh, native Pakistan to speak, he wasn't allowed to because he was a Sufi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can see that. There is a big, uh, uh, Sunnis in general, they look at Sufis as uh, they, are not the right, they are not on the right path. The same way they look at Shias, so oh. there is a big difference here. Okay, but uh, uh, can, we, uh, tell, can you tell us more of your views about uh, Islam? Yeah, so just a brief introduction about Islam for our viewers that doesn't, you know, don't have much uh, information about it. So actually Islam, it's a, it's a monolithic Abrahamic religion. Uh, the keystones for Islam are uh, the Quran, which is uh, the book that uh, Muslims believe it, it came from God, word by word, and it's a absolute truth. Uh, the second keystone, it's uh, the teaching and the sunnah of uh, Muhammad, which Muslims believe they are the, he is the last prophet. Uh, for you to become a Muslim, the main five uh, uh, basic rules that you have to follow is you have to say the Shahada, which admitting that there is only one God and Muhammad is the prophet of this God, uh, paying the Zakah, which is donations, um, and then uh, fasting, Ramadan, and then visiting the Holy Land in, uh, in Arabia. So, so this is just a brief introduction about uh, uh, generally about Islam. Uh, okay. Um, well, you, you mentioned uh, Christianity. Uh, what is the relation between uh, uh, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism? It's actually a very good question. So, uh, Christianity, uh, Islam came. Uh, its main message is to restore the, uh, what's called the true Abrahamic religion. Um, uh, there is a there is a lot of commonalities between Islam, uh, Christianity, and Judaism. As a matter of fact, I can I can say that um, Islam is about 85 percent Judaism. Uh, they agree on the same prophets. They agree on um, on uh, uh, on Moses for sure that he is one of the prophets. Yeah, and, uh, and, and a lot of the biblical stories. In, in, in fact, um, uh, the the view is that uh, Muhammad is. Uh, was just one of a line of prophets yeah. uh, that uh, they go back to uh, Adam, uh, uh, Noah, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Abraham, mm -hmm. Moses, uh, and Jesus, and uh, but but then uh, they say that uh, all of those were uh, speaking for God, all of and uh, uh, and and. Perhaps some of those teachings got corrupted with time. So now uh, the revelation to Muhammad is the final perfect word of God. Yes, that is that is very true, and that's why uh, Muslims believe in Jesus, but they believe in him as uh, as a prophet, and uh, they believe that basically Muhammad came to res to get Christians out of the uh, wrong path, which is following. Uh, are looking at Jesus the way they look at right now, uh, but they still believe in the virgin birth and they uh, uh, believe in the same prophets as uh, Judaism. Uh, so that's why this was also one of the <laughs> another one of the triggering factors for me. So, if if Islam is built on these religions, 
uh, uh, Christianity and Judaism, then once one of these religions is falsified, then the Islam fall as well. Um, so, um, doing my, some of my readings in the uh, Bible and some of the inaccuracies in the Bible and and so on was one of the triggering factors that made me evaluate my faith in general in Islam. Yeah, we've we've talked uh, <coughs> at length on this show about. Uh, questions regarding uh, some of the uh, uh, authenticity and uh, accuracy of the Bible. Uh, certainly when it was written, uh, people weren't dumb. I mean, they, they, their understanding of the world was perhaps limited, and uh, they tried to incorporate as much of their understanding as they could, but uh, uh, there are places where Clearly, they uh, they failed in their uh, their task. Yes, yes, that is that is true. Uh, uh, and again, you know, it's a big part of these religions in general is that there is really not much historical evidence that we can use to. Uh, oh, okay, uh, go, go ahead, and, and we have a, a call waiting. But uh, go ahead and finish your sentence, and we'll pick it up. Uh, no, I was just saying that uh, you know a big part of this religion is that most of the uh, uh, there is no not much really historical evidence that we can get to know about this religion except the books that's re written from the scholars of this religion. So, okay, so let's take okay. okay, so we have a call waiting. Uh, uh, caller, uh, thank you for calling. Would you uh, give us your name and um, uh, how, how we may refer to you? Well, this is Faceless Forest, and I've been watching the show, and I have a question for Imam. Sure. All right. So you, you guys were talking about how Islam is sort of like a restoration of Judaism. And I, my question is actually how most uh, followers of Islam learn about what in Christian culture we call the Old Testament. Um, Christian culture, you know, there are lots of Bibles where over half of the book is Jewish. Uh, uh, you know, there are modifications to it. How does that work for people in Islamic cultures? Forrest, you've been kind of breaking up, but I, I think your, uh, your, your question was, um, if uh, Muslims don't read the Bible the way uh, uh, Christians or the Torah the way Jews do, how do they know about the, how do they learn about the traditions of those religions? Yes. Uh, okay, so let me just correct one thing for us. So Islam didn't come for restoration of Judaism uh, to the right path. It came for the restoration of the Abrahamic faith, which, uh, which was before Judaism. Uh, but their uh, Muslim um, uh, looking at uh, the way they believe in the Bible right now or the Torah, uh, they believe first they believe that the Bible uh, has been modified from its original texts. So they don't agree with the current version that exists right now. And, and the main reason. Bible, let me interrupt. When you say Bible, do you mean what I would call the Hebrew Bible, which is the Old Testament in a Christian Bible? No, I'm talking about the Christian Bible, the New, uh, the New Testament. So they believe that the New Testament has been modified from its original text. And what exists right now is not the true Bible. Uh, as far as the Hebrew or the Torah, uh, there is so many books in the Torah. Uh, but the main core of the Torah, they believe it's unchanged. Because they believe it's coming from God, same way as uh, uh, as Quran, but then some of the supplementary books, uh, they believe it has been also modified in their, uh, from their original text. But um, if you read the Quran, uh, there is a lot of mention about a lot of biblical stories and prophets. Uh, but this, there is not much uh, mention of uh, details about these prophets or some of these stories. Uh, it's just main like taglines. So actually through the history, the way that Islamic scholars has been filling these gaps and the stories is actually using uh, the Old Testament uh, and the Torah uh, to basically fill the gap in these stories because they use it as a reference for them as well. Okay, so in Christian cultures, we've got this 
this Bible that I think a lot of people get exposed to in some we call some school because don't have a fickle chance that our school at least should. Now, a um, young person growing up in Egypt, you be part of or all of what we call the old testament. Oh, you hear what um, he said? Um, Forrest, could you repeat that? Yes, please. You, you're breaking out. Uh, I, I'm sorry, it's a cell phone and it's not good sometimes. So, Did you read growing up the Hebrew Bible? No, no, we did not read it. Actually, as a matter of fact, there is so many, uh, so, uh, so few Muslims that even read about either the Hebrew Bible or the Christian Bible. Um, they basically, it's just, as I said, they believe in it as it is. Uh, and they, they, uh, they just read the Islamic scholars. And actually, as a matter of fact, even reading the Islamic uh, scholars, few people even read this. Uh, it's just people, it depends more on listening. <laughs> uh, so I did not read it as a matter of fact. But my dad has actually, um, as I said, my dad is a Sufi, but he actually wrote uh, multiple books, uh, comparative religion. Um, so he, he, he read in depth the, the, the Torah and the Christian Bible. And uh, he wrote books that comparing the three, uh, the three books, these, uh, these two plus the Quran. Uh, but he looks at it from a different way. He looks at it basically trying to find the commonalities to prove that the Quran is right from these uh, other two books. Uh, but did I answer your okay. question? I think you answered my question. I was trying to learn if reading these books was something you did in your uh, school system. But it sounds like um, it's the Jewish book is not something that you read, it's just referred. No, it's, yes. Okay, let me say thanks much, and I'll clear the line so that you can get some other callers. Thank you, Forrest. Thank you. Uh, this raises a, a, a question in my mind. Uh, uh, what it, was your relation with your father when you were growing up? Uh, was Did he teach you? Uh, did, um, did, did he do more? Uh, just to establish an atmosphere in the family? He did, actually. I, I, I contribute. He doesn't like to hear this, but I contribute where I am right now and me living Islam to his teaching for us. Not in a bad way, actually, in a good way. Because um, uh, raised up, raising, uh, being raised as a Sufi and looking uh, at philosophical meanings, he uh, it taught me how to be more open-minded, how to uh, receive this information, not literally. Uh, but still being in Egypt, uh, there is so much constraints from the society uh, and you're conditioned all the time that you have to follow this. So even though you're a Sufi and you're allowed to think philosophically, there is some red lines that you cannot pass. So for example, you cannot think about the nature of God because uh, this can lead you to basically to where I am right now. Uh, you cannot uh, think about the authenticity of the Quran. Uh, you cannot pass these red lines. Uh, so, But, uh, uh, you know, scholars have examined uh, both the Hebrew Bible and the Christian editions in uh, considerable detail. And um, uh, they have uh, uh, learned that uh, the the uh, Old Testament, the Hebrew portion, uh, is is the result of a compilation of a number of different authors, mm -hmm. and uh, this is done through uh, kind of linguistic analysis and and so on. And um, uh, we have a little more historical background for the New Testament, and we know that um, there were lots of writings, lots of books that. Uh, um, were produced and then at some point it was decided to uh, kind of collect and standardize and, uh, uh, and, and, and so the Bible, the New Testament was created. In the process, uh, a lot of other writings were thrown away and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and ordered destroyed and so on. Um, um, I, there, I understand there may have been some uh, 
some of that kind of uh, manipulation going on in the uh, early part, and 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 what what would be the basis of the uh, the disputes about what things might mean? Yeah. So actually. Uh I will tell you first from the point of view of Muslims. So the Muslim look at the Quran that it's a book from God the way it is. So if you ask any one of them, so basically they will say it's a word of God and it cannot be changed. And the reason why they are saying this, they're actually using one of the verses from the Quran which say, which means we gave you the book and we're going to protect it. So they use this as a validation method. From, from their perspective. Uh, but you actually, there is, uh, there is so many, just looking at from a scholarship point of view, uh, there are so many doubts about the origin of the Quran. So first, uh, let me just give you an introduction how the Quran came. Uh, so uh, the Quran was received on Muhammad when he was at age of 40, uh, on a span of 23 uh, years of his prophecy. Uh, so he every day he gets like few verses depends on the, uh, 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 what situation it is. So it didn't come in a specific order; it was just separate verses. Um, if you open the Quran right now, uh, it's it's a book that has chapters, 114 chapters, and each chapter composed of multiple verses. Um, so the way it came to it is right now, uh, there is different version or different stories uh, that talks about how the Quran was collected. Uh, so one of them that say that uh, it was collected by uh, Abu Bakr, which was one of the followers of Muhammad and uh, the first uh, Khalifa uh, uh, after Muhammad, uh, basically asked, uh, asked a guy called uh, Ziyad ibn Thabit uh, after, his, uh, after the death of many people that memorized the Quran in, in, in the uh, Yamama uh, wars to basically to get these people together and try to get the verses from their memories and put it in one book. Uh, another version say that uh, Uthman, which was the third uh, Khalifa after uh, uh, Muhammad death, um, asked also Ziyad ibn Sabit to collect these verses from, from these people. And then once they were collected, they, uh, he basically burned all the other versions and he started distribu distributing this one version. Uh, but even though he tried to, to do this, uh, some of the versions, different versions survived. And actually, uh, one of these uh, versions is uh, it's called Sana script. And it was found in a mosque buried in Yemen. And uh, actually, the Yemen authorities, they're uh, preventing people from actually looking at it right now. But the German uh, uh, persons that found it were able to extract, uh, to take a digital copy. And, and there is a digital copy of it in Germany. Uh, but this is just about the collection. Um, I think we have a slide. So this is actually a slide, if you hear, this is a Sana script. This is a, a version that was found in uh, Yemeni. Uh, and as you can see, actually, there, if you look in more depth, you will find like uh, letters that was erased and written on top of it. Um, so this raises a lot of questions. Um, the second problem, um, even though Osman tried to destroy all this other uh, uh, text, uh, that uh, even though uh, uh, the texts were destroyed, the Arabic language didn't came to its form right now till later in the actually uh, eighth uh, century. Uh, actually, late the ninth century. Uh, so the way the Arabic language is. Um, uh, was in the beginning, uh, there was no. It wasn't a pointed language, uh, so we have multiple letters in uh, in Arabic that can read the same, uh, and you cannot differentiate between them uh, unless you have a point. And I think we have a picture for this here. Uh, so actually, if you look at the first top line, so these three letters, if you remove the dots uh, from them. You cannot know which one is which. So actually, this was not for this. The way it is right now didn't come till late of the uh, eighth century. Uh, uh, so the first letter is B, and the second is T, and so the third one is T, and so on. So there is actually uh, uh, 22 indistinguishable uh, Arabic letter from each other if you remove these dots. Um, on top of that, there is actually directional 
uh, 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 directional uh, 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 vowels that you can put on top of each letter and then it will change the way it sounds. Uh, this also didn't come till later in the 8th century. Um, so, so now you come and tell me that uh, I collected all these verses from the memories of people that didn't have dots and you couldn't differentiate what is uh, 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 what are the letters from each other and then after this was from 80 years, someone else came and put the dots and made the language the way it is right now. Yeah, uh, as, as, as I understand it, that uh, the early uh, Arabic was a lot like Hebrew in yes. that uh, they, they only wrote down the consonants and no vowels. Mm -hmm. And in, but, uh, but, I also understand that in Arabic uh, there are triads of consonants that um, uh, serve as a root for many other words. And uh, so basically you take these three consonants and add vowels before and after and in the middle and so yes. on to, to uh, create a lot of the, uh, the Arabic words. So if those are missing, then uh, one would be forced to uh, derive the meaning by context. Yes, exactly, exactly. And uh, not just that, it's um, the literacy was really very, um, illiteracy was very high in this, uh, in this era. Uh, not a lot of people knew how to write. Um, and uh, one of the things that they used to validate the Quran, because uh, 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 Muslims believe that the miracle of Islam is in the Quran. This is one of the big points. So if your miracle is coming in actually a book that has question about the authenticity of it, then uh, it was a big question mark for me. Um, uh, uh, so they used some of the poetry that they say that was written back in the days uh, before uh, the Islam. Uh, they have uh, what's called uh, the seven, uh, uh, seven big po poems that was hanged on, on the Kaaba in, in Mecca, and they say basically that this is the validation that uh, uh, the Arabic language existed before the Quran. Uh, but uh, if you look at there, first of all, uh, the, uh, the people of the tribes of Mecca at this time, they didn't write read a lot. As I said, they, you know, uh, they couldn't try to read. Uh, second, uh, the language, the Arabic language, the way it is right now, it didn't come till later in the ninth century. So. There's also another big question here. Uh, so uh, perhaps we should um, uh, take a break for the moment and uh, uh, for our mid-program break. Uh, so uh, in case you're just tuning in, this is Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalist of East Tennessee. Free Thought Forum is funded jointly by them and by individual contributions. Uh, shows are live <coughs> excuse me, most every Tuesday from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern uh, time uh, on community access television. Tell your out-of-town friends to see us streaming online at ctvnox.org. This, this is a call-in show, and we're live today, November 5th, 2013, and viewers can call in now to the number on the screen with a short comment or question Call in now while we go to an informative break. If you live in or around the Knoxville area and are questioning your religious beliefs or simply believe in one less God than everyone else, well, you're not alone. The Atheist Society of Knoxville is a fun and friendly group of people just like you that meets twice a week at a bar or restaurant. We meet every Tuesday night following the show at Barley's Tap Room and Pizzeria for happy hour. You'll find our group either inside or on the patio. Look for Richard Dawkins' silver-jacketed book, The God Delusion, standing upright on the table. On Fridays, we meet at Agave Azul or the Beard and Beer Market. But if you plan to preach, proselytize, provoke or punch, please don't. We all question what we believe at one point in our lives. If this is the time for you, come join us for food, drink, conversation, and fun. 
Do you find stories of talking snakes laughable? Do you prefer the scientific method over supernatural beliefs? Are you concerned about religious leaders and organizations imposing their values and rules on your body, your family, and the rest of our society? Well, take comfort in the fact that you're not alone. The Rationalists of East Tennessee meets weekly for fellowship and provides a forum for people who support skeptical thinking and rational discussion of these and other issues. To find out more information or to find out about our next meeting, visit us on the web at www.rationalist.org. Uh, the Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, meets two times a week. Uh, we have evening meetups for fun, food, drink, and conversation. ASK's purpose is to supply a venue for community, camaraderie, and outreach to atheists, agnostics, freethinkers, and other like-minded persons in East Tennessee area. <clears throat> Our Tuesday meeting is going on right now at Barley's Tap Room and Pizzeria in the Knoxville Old City. The Rationalist of East Tennessee has Sunday activities involving lively presentations and discussion of subjects topical and timeless. Once a month, we get together for a book club. Uh, we need not have uh, read the book to attend, but of course it helps. Uh, visit rationalist.org to find us November's uh, book uh, is A God Argument, The Case Against Religion and for Humanism by A.C. Uh, Grayling. Join us at uh, Barnes & Noble uh, Booksellers 8029 Kingston Pike at 4 p.m. November 10th. Both the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalist of East Tennessee help provide a social outlet where you'll find that if you don't believe in God, you, you are, are not alone. alone. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, we were, we were uh, discussing uh, the, uh, the, the script uh, in which, uh, the Arabic script in which the Quran was written and uh, it's uh, the way it appears today with ambiguities removed with uh, these uh, uh, dots and so on. But um, uh, let, let's go on and um, what, what can you, uh, uh, what, what sources do we have and what can we learn about the life of the Prophet Muhammad? Uh, well, Muhammad died in uh, 632, and actually the earliest material that we have on his life um, uh, was written by Ibn Ishaq in uh, 750. Uh, in other words, like 120 years after uh, Muhammad's death. Um, uh, and also, uh, we don't have the full work of Ibn Ishaq. We have the work of uh, Ibn Hisham, which died at 834, and he took part of Ibn Ishaq work and he continued. So actually, we the only text we have about the life of Muhammad is written by an Islamic scholar 200 years after his death. So uh, I, I, I'm going to diverge again for a moment. I see this IBN in people's names yeah. uh, very often. What what does that mean? Uh, Ibn means son. So son Ibn. of uh, Hish oh. So okay. oh. <laughs> <laughs> like names Johnson and yes. so, Peterson. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, I, I, I have another question that sure. I'll ask again later if we have more time. But uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, maybe it'll have to wait till after the program, as to how uh, names are Formed, but we will we'll talk about that later. Okay. So, uh, tell us about other sacred texts. So, the second uh, source in Islamic uh, uh, religion is what's called hadith, which is basically it's a collection of sayings and teaching of uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and uh, the way uh, hadith is transformed through history is through what's called a sned. So basically, you, someone heard Muhammad saying this, and then another person said, heard this, and so on. Uh, so it's basically uh, translating it, transferring it through sources. Uh, there are actually eight, uh, six uh, main uh, trusted books in the Hadith, uh, which is Bukhari, the Muslim, uh, Ibn Majah, uh, and Nisa'i and uh, Abu Dawood, as well as uh, the Tirmizi. Uh, 
uh, but really what uh, first of all let me tell you there is actually 600 and 600 about 600 southern hadith I, I have no clue how someone like in the span of of his life can say all this time all this uh, second uh, uh, they started eliminating some of this said basically some of them like were put later in the books uh, from external sources uh, but even their most uh, the most trusted sources uh, uh, for example like al bukhari which is one of the texts that some some muslims even think about it as the second quran you know how how they think authentic it is uh, he actually died 238 years after uh, the life of uh, after the death of muhammad uh, as well as nisa'i also he died 280 years after uh, the death of muhammad so all the books uh, of hadith were written way later in the islamic uh, uh, time so so i guess this is kind of like um, oh, oh, so, so these there, there would still be another um, uh, literature. Um, I mean, you, you talked about the Quran, which is supposedly the uh, the the actual word of God. Mm -hmm. uh, then reports of uh, this of uh, things that uh, Muhammad may have said during his uh, lifetime, uh, kind of. Um, uh, a, a secondary source, but then uh, there must have there must be lots of additional uh, commentaries and yes. uh, a whole literature. Yes, yes. So there is actually like uh, there is Islamic scholars, like main Islamic scholars, like there are four of them. Um, uh, that people that they basically sat down and everyone took the the Quran and the hadith the hadith by uh, from uh, uh, Muhammad and they basically came up with the hierarchy of what to do and what not to do uh, and this is what people refers to these days um, uh, so one of them is uh, 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 Ibn Malik is one of the main ones, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as Ibn, uh, uh, Ibn Hanbal, which were m the most extreme of, the, of these four. And uh, a lot of the extremists right now use some of his text as uh, references to what, what uh, they do. Uh, so. But, but um, I, I guess the way Islam developed, uh, it's, it's Kind of uh, not not just guiding what you should think and 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 uh, proper thoughts and of uh, what you should do, good versus evil decisions you should make, but uh, are further into details about what you should eat and uh, 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 etiquette mm -hmm. and uh, a, a complete. It is. It's actually uh, if you ask. A like regular Muslim, what do you think about Islam? Is it a religion? He will say no, it's a way of life. Uh, and and this, I think, this is one of the most dangerous things, because uh, it, you know, it it gets it, even to the most private things. It's like you cannot go to the toilet this way. You have to go this way. So it's it 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 can be over the top sometimes. But yeah, it goes to the to every detail, single details in your life. Uh, so, I, in my point, in my opinion, and there was a lot of people that asked asked for reformation, and asked for basically to take the main principles and try to reform it in the modern days. But then you, they will always get shut down by the mainstreams that uh, they want the same teachings and the same. Uh, 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 way people were living 1400 years ago. So they didn't go through the, the same reformations that happened in Christianity back. Yeah, uh, that, that's one of the problems, that being the last revelation and no more revelations and, uh, and supposedly complete, then it, you have no way to accommodate uh, change in life uh, uh, and, and 
the, the, to accommodate to modern life. I, I was reading here something in the uh, Wikipedia uh, talking about um, modern day uh, problems that uh, Muslims face. It says, new, Muslims intele new Muslim intellectuals are beginning to arise and are increasingly separating uh, perennial Islamic beliefs from archaic cultural traditions. Liberal Islam is a movement that attempts to reconcile religious tradition with modern norms of uh, secular government governance and uh, human rights. Its supporters say there are multiple ways to read Islam's sacred text and stress the, uh, the need to uh, leave room for uh, independent thought in religious matters. Uh, women's issues uh, receive a lot of s uh, a significant weight in the modern discourse on Islam. So I, th I think that kind of expresses uh, the uh, the some of the attempts mm -hmm. to modernize, and perhaps we can get back to that uh, yeah, let's take a little this bit later. Call. Okay. Hello. Welcome to Free Thought Forum. Thank you for calling. Can you give us a name or a nickname, please? Sure. My name's uh, Jr. Jr. Oh. I uh, I think of the old Jr. from Dallas. Uh, yeah, so. who shot Jr.? Yeah, I used to get that a lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay Jr. Uh, what uh, what do you have to uh, to add or I inquire? I just got a question. I just got a question here. Um, you know, I was just wondering if uh, Muslims, you know, they just say the prayers and and kind of uh, you know allow themselves to be spoon fed the rhetoric, or do they actually read the Quran? Because here. America, you know, we have a lot of Christians that go to church and allow them, allow the preacher to tell them what the Bible says without actually reading the Bible, you know? Yeah. Uh, that, that's a very good question, actually. Uh, so yes, a lot of people read the Quran because reading the Quran is one of the, uh, in every prayer, you have to read the Quran. Um, and uh, during the fasting month of Ramadan, they read the Quran. But <laughs> here is a catch. They cannot uh, think about the mean, most of them, don't think about the meaning of these words. They use texts that already existed by other scholars to basically understand what these verses say. Okay, so they're not actually reading it for themselves to decipher what is. They are more like sort of the they are more like repeating it. Yeah. So so right, this where they're allowing the preacher or whoever to you know kind of interpret it for them. Yeah, yeah. They basically have to right. refer to the old. Uh, scholars that actually trans uh, explain these verses. Um, right. Well, I mean, that's sort of the same. The Christian preacher church today would kind of, you know, has does the same thing, teaches the lessons on what the Bible's trying to say, you know. Yeah. Hmm. But, uh, uh, that, well, I was wondering, because uh, we see statistically in this country a lot of Christians don't actually read the Bible. Because, you know, that's a great way to convert people is uh, to have them actually read it and understand the nonsense in it, you know. So I was just wondering that. So I, so they they read the Quran, but they're still prohibited from actually, you know, delving into too deep on their own. Okay. Um, um, okay, Jr. Thank you for calling. Okay. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you, and uh, uh, we hope to hear from you again. Okay. Um, so. Uh, I, I, I lost my, my train of thought here, but uh, uh, one of the, the next things on our agenda was uh, we were going to uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, scientific uh, studies of the Quran and testing it, comparing it against uh, modern science. So uh, uh, to what extent is uh, the Quran being tested against modern science? Okay, I, I will tell you something first. I was raised the way my dad raised me is don't mix Quran with science because it's two different things and once you put it in test with science then you have to basically examine it as a scientific book but and it's one of the movements that started in, in late uh, last century and it was pushed by Saudi Arabia and they actually f created the entire university uh, and uh, one of the main scholars, his name is Zaghlul Nagar, that he's trying to use the Quran and 
trying to validate the Quran by saying, by mentioning some of the scientific facts in the Quran, and saying this is one of the miracles of the Quran of the scientific facts. So it's it's a movement that is happening right now, and they are pushing for it. Uh, so, uh, you know, as as a scientist. Uh, when you tell me I'm going to validate this scientific argument, then I'm going to say, okay, well, if you accepted this challenge, then okay, let me look at your text, and then we can see that it actually full agree with what science uh, uh, finds now or not. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so for example, like some of the inaccuracies that exists in the Quran right now, uh, there is really different, uh, so many of them, but some of them is basically, uh, first of all, the Quran say that humans were created from clay. And actually, this is uh, really interested, when, interesting when I, when I read it, because uh, actually it was in one of the ancient Egyptian uh, scriptures uh, and drawing, uh, Tahut, which is one of the ancient Egyptian god, he creates um, a figure like look like a human from clay. Um, so I thought it's interesting that, interesting that it was actually mentioned in the Quran. Um, okay, I think we have another four. Go, go, go ahead and finish your sentence. And okay. Uh, so yeah, so I, I think that was really interesting uh, to see this uh, clay uh, compared with the Hut uh, uh, story. Uh, the second thing was, you know, Adam and Eve um, and you know, it's contradiction with, uh, with evolution and what we know right now. Um, and also Quran always stresses that humans are made on the best form. They were created on this current form, which is the best form, which is the form of God. Uh, uh, which we, oh, go ahead. Okay, let's go ahead and pick up our, our caller now. Uh, hello, caller. Welcome to Free Thought Forum, and thank you for uh, calling. May we have your name or nickname, please? It's Chuck. Chuck. Oh, how are you doing, Chuck? Uh, what, what can we do for you today? Well, I called to ask the Muslim view on evolution and global warming. And I'm wondering if among Muslims there is a kind of uh, fight as there is between Christians and non-Christians over creationism versus evolution. That's that's a, that's a very good point. That's actually what we were talking about right now. Uh, global warming, uh, <laughs> Muslims are so behind right now. Most of them are like in third world countries that is actually they are not even thinking about this issue. So it didn't have a direct hit with them right now yet. Uh, so there is not much that, not many Muslims that has been talking about global warming and the effect of it. Uh, as far as uh, creationism and evolution, you know, they, they Muslims believe in the same uh, story of creationism. Uh, you know, Adam and Eve, and that uh, God created Adam, and then Eve came from his uh, ribs, uh, and uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, 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 there, me growing up actually in Egypt, uh, we touched on like you know, uh, Darwin theory, like, like, briefly in biology in, uh, in, in school. Uh, but if you mention the word Darwin in Egypt, it's as if you're mentioning the name of, like, a demon or something like that. You know, I don't believe in demons, but for them it's like, no. You know, so it's uh, always direct attack for uh, evolution and uh, um, uh, Darwin theory. Um, uh, it's actually even the field of anthropology in Egypt, uh, studying it in schools is very, really very limited because they want to limit the material that you actually can uh, know about evolution because they don't want to open this door. Uh, so, uh, well. <laughs> well, one of the predictions uh, of global warming is that eventually the mid-latitudes will become desert, uh, and people will have to be living in, in northern and southern uh, parts of uh, the world. Yeah. I, I'm wondering, and they predict mass migrations from people from the mid-latitudes. Uh, it seems to me that that would uh, really 
affect Muslims, that uh, they would uh, have trouble living uh, where they do now. And I'm wondering if, if anyone has ever yeah, I mean, there is really, as I said, you know, like, uh, talking about just about the Middle East, uh, and environment and uh, is not really a big push right now. Because uh, as I said, they have so many problems that environment is really the least uh, of their worries. Um, uh, so, um, but I'm sure it will affect them at some point, and at some point, uh, when they, they start feeling the effect, it's going to... Uh, you know, it, it's going to hit them, and they will have to address it uh, some way or another. Yeah. Well, I, I guess uh, although it may not be in the historical memory of the uh, people there, uh, they have experienced this uh, already with the change in climate in the Sahara, uh, which was once a uh, a well watered uh, uh, environment mm -hmm. with rivers and. Uh, and and all that is left now are a few oases and uh, maybe some remnants of some earlier habitation. Yeah. If uh, if we were actually to uh, have a worldwide attempt to put a damper on global warming, it seems to me that would affect the uh, oil producing states pretty heavily. Uh, and I'm just wondering, and the economies, and I'm wondering. If uh, in Saudi Arabia, for example, was, I know they've been looking into solar power, but uh, in terms of money income and being able to deal with the rest of the world, that's a pretty powerful reason for taking a strong look at it. Yeah, I mean, at some point, the oil supply will will deplete. So I don't know when this is going to happen, but it's going to happen at some okay. point. So. Well, thank you for calling, thank Chuck. Uh, we're going to uh, move on. We've just got a few minutes left here. Uh, thank you for calling, and look forward to seeing you again. OK, uh, <clears throat> we were continuing on about some of the, uh, uh, the, the contradictions or inconsistencies. Some, yeah, inaccuracies, with, with, I would say, or. But uh, uh, I, I guess I would like to uh, uh, to to move on to sure. another, uh, uh, and, and I, I must say that <clears throat> last uh, Sunday after the RET meeting, <clears throat> I had a two and a half hour conversation <laughs> with <laughs> Imam and uh, his friend, and uh, one of the questions I raised was, uh, well, what is the future of uh, of Islam? Um, is given its concentration on the past, uh, is there a future where it could become more friendly uh, to the modern world? Uh, that's really a very, um, a very hard question. Um, uh, uh, I see, I see two types of Muslim, and I, were my, I dealt with two types of Muslims. Uh, Muslims that is uh, from the Middle East. Uh, uh, where people there in general are very sentimental, very, um, uh, uh, they are not as rational as uh, people here in the West. Uh, so even Christian there, it's very hard to do any reformation. Um, so, I, you know, I, I don't know without changing the people mentality and the way people think, how can we do this reformation? Um, people are very sentimental and uh, but I would say, just briefly, because I think we're running out of time, yeah. that with no reformation, I don't think, I think there will be um, a conflict with Islam and modern uh, okay, way of okay. life. So. Uh, okay, it's time to, to start wrapping things up. If you want to contact us, uh, get out your pen and, pe uh, pen and paper and write this down. This has been a free thought. Uh, forum program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. I'm Jonas Holderman. And I am Imam al Haq. Uh, please send us feedback. Uh, leave voicemail at 865-272-9060 or email us at freethoughtsforum at yahoo.com. Uh, you can see this show Tuesdays from 5 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time on this Knoxville station and at uh, 2100 Greenwich Mean Time at uh, ctvnox.org. We would like to, th to send our...